welcome to this session of our Tarot on 2020 a series of live videos that we're doing here in the Facebook group for the Tarot Association Tarot Professionals Facebook group and um, my name is Marcus Katz and I'm the author of Tarosophy and a number of other titles uh, that I brought uh, sort of a Kabbalistic and an NLP view to tarot and today we're going to be covering a very practical technique, a very short but powerful technique and um, welcome to everyone who's following through the series. I hope you're all doing very well in um, the current lockdown and um, that you have um, at least some um, water to drink and um, that you're keeping sheltered well and healthy um, and hello around the world as um, you join us in the recording this is the wave for the recording that's the wave for today so um, we're going to cover a very simple technique a practical technique but i want to introduce because we've got time to talk about it the kabbalistic underpinnings of it um, because then you can go away and think of other utilizations of the theory to the actual practice itself um, Tarosophy actually um, has got like 50 exercises in it throughout the book. This is the original printing um, that was published in Thailand and um, unfortunately the publisher let me down with it and um, didn't pay me properly. Um, uh, continued to sell the Kindle titles without reimbursing me for it and it took about two years to get it back off him so that I could self-publish it. So the um, uh, the version of Tarosophy that you can find on Amazon and on Kindle is my version of it um, and um, uh, this one uh, which um, I don't know what he did with the um, actual published versions of it but I've got one copy well I've got two copies the other copy has got a big long split along the side um, um, but these these go for a lot of money on a, on a, um, uh, Amazon but you can actually buy it just the same version um, from, from me directly through Amazon and so on and um, that, that was the book that really I tried to put everything in that I thought was different about tarot uh, from, from my particular work and this is one of those simple examples that I think um, uh, comes from tarot um, and comes from tarosophy by applying both um, Kabbalah and NLP to it um, just listening to people. NLP is very much about listening to people and incorporating and utilizing what they say. And I bet you know as a tarot reader one of the worst things is, or the best thing, is when you do a massive reading, uh, you do a very complicated reading, you tell the person everything about their situation, you explain it in detail, all of the psychology of it, the intricacies of it, the, uh, their spiritual point at this very moment, and you do the whole reading, you finish off the reading, and the client looks at you and says, but what do I do? What do I do about it? And um, I got used to hearing that question, so I came up with a method for what you do, um, what you do about it. Because in a lot of uh, brief, um, uh, what's called brief therapy, and uh, brief, um, brief therapeutic approaches, outcome orientated approaches, and positive outcome orientated approaches, you don't have long with clients, so you really need to um, set up some stepping stones that they can actually then bridge for themselves when they're ready to do it. But at least you can lay the groundwork for their own unconscious to actually make those connections and guide them long after your session with them. And that's where the um, next step method comes from that we're going to cover today. And for those who um, have already um, practiced the next step method or um, come across the um, next step method, then uh, bear with me because I'm going to explain and explore a little bit around it as well that might not be um, obvious from the uh, the book itself. So we go back to Kabbalah 
and if you want to um, pursue the um, Kabbalistic framework we've already set up, please go back and revise the first 10 sessions. So that's 400 minutes of revision work that's um, in the units group, um, in the unit section of the group. But um, briefly, K Kabbalah is a Jewish mystical system. It was brought into Western esotericism at the turn of the century. Um, and um, a lot of it is known by the Tree of Life, this diagram here that purports to map our relationship to the universe, the way the universe is created, and the way that we can reascend to a sense of unity with the universe itself. Not bad for a little diagram that fits on an A4 sheet of paper. So one of the things that we've um, talked about is um, the uh, uh, paths on the Tree of Life. There are 22 of them that relate to the 22 letters. And this is just one way of arranging the Tree of Life. There are many other ways of arranging it. Um, but on this diagram, we have 22 paths that relate to the 22 letters, and they, those relate to the 22 major arcana. What I'd like to talk to um, talk about first, so that we can do this next step method, is the fact that the map shows that creation works in a lightning flash that comes through these uh, sephiroth. And the sephiroth are the ten aspects of our relationship to the divine. And we can figure that these exist in the universe by the fact that we have ten fingers, and also the fact that um, we look at the um, um, paths between the Sephiroth and then we can deduce what the nature of the Sephiroth sort of must be even if we can't know them directly. So we look at the Empress card and the path here which is called Daleth, the letter Daleth, the Hebrew letter Daleth, and we look at nature, we, lo we look at um, uh, pregnancy, we look at um, um, any aspect of nature at all and we sort of get the sense that there must be a male and female component to it and that there's an underlining pattern that is masculine and feminine, positive, negative. There's a, there's a binary system, a duality that exists in order for creation to arise. There must have been nothing and then there was something. And therefore we deduce the patterns of Bina and Hokma, uh, which mean in Hebrew understanding and wisdom, um, through our observation of nature. And that's why um, witchcraft, for example, can fit into a Kabbalistic framework because at its highest level as um, natural mysticism, um, when we observe nature, we can observe uh, the workings of the divine within it. It's a form of uh, what's called um, exemplarism, where we take the universe as an example of what reality must be like and therefore everything in the universe exemplifies um, the workings of the divine at some level or another and that's a, a spiritual path, a, a religious path called exemplarism and um, witchcraft taken from uh, the sort of lunar um, basic form of it can be elevated all the way up to um, its highest mystical component through exemplarism, through taking it all the way up to this must be um, um, everything in nature is everything that is divine and therefore one is an example of the other. And that sort of um, takes it up to this level here. So coming down the tree of life, creation um, is seen to go through um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stages. And of course we know in our tarot cards that we have the aces, twos, threes, fours, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you'll see already that because of this diagram, the sixes are in the middle. Have you ever wondered why in the White Smith and the Thoth deck and the Golden Dawn deck that the sixes are actually the sort of midpoints and the transition points of the deck um, as opposed to the fives, which is sort of technically halfway? Well, it's because the uh, designers um, and artists of the uh, White Smith deck, the Thoth deck, the Golden Dawn deck were schooled in Kabbalah. So they automatically saw the sixes 
Um, I'm always reminded of the Six of Swords, for example, which is Tifereth in uh, Yetzirah. Um, yes, Tifereth in Yetzirah, the swords, the world of uh, formation, the world of thought. That's the thoughts moving onwards when they uh, reach this midpoint of Tifereth. It's the beauty of thought, in effect, uh, that we see in the Six of Swords. So, basically, the Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, follow a sequence, and when they get to the ten, those ten wands that the guy is carrying, they have to be bound together to make one wand, and that returns it back to Keitha, because Keitha is in Malkuth, and Malkuth is in Keitha, when you understand that the tree and the universe and everything and you are just all the same thing. It just collapses into one whole, um, but until that point, Malkuth is in Keitha and Keitha is in Malkuth, and they're kept as two distinct things. Okay, makes sense. So the minor arcana, which is creation. Everything follows these 10 stages. Um, no matter what you do that's creative, it will always start with a point of an idea and go through um, sorting it out, making some sort of plan, and then generally working down until you have finalized it and manifest it here. And the closer it is to what you envisage, then the better the tree of life um, is um, structured. Um, or, the, or the better aligned to the divine pattern that it actually feels. So here's the next step method and what I'm going to do is um, we've got a tarot reading, here's one I prepared earlier, it's a three card reading, there are no positions in this, um, thank you for your kind comments Joanne, um, and we have three cards here, um, right let me do this properly, so here is a three card reading for somebody and this is basically the answer to their question in terms of where am I at now and um, how do you explain my current situation and these are the three cards that we have poured for the person we have the ten, um, the ten of swords, uh, the devil and the um, knight of cups that's right um, knight Yep, yep, that's right for my example. Okay, so this is their current situation. Um, can any of the um, tarot readers who want to um, um, comment on this um, give us a general idea of how you would generally read this as the situation that a person is in? They want to know um, what the hell is happening to me um, and... Um, uh, these are the three cards that we have poured for them. So this is just an example with a three card reading. This method works with any any reading at all. Okay, so um, let's start with the uh, Ten of Swords, then look at the Devil, and then the Knight of Cups. Is it is it basically a good situation they're in, or a, a terrible situation? Um, what's the... Um, opportunity of the situation or the block of the situation. How would you read those three cards? This is for um, those in uh, obviously watching this live. We've got 22 people so hopefully um, someone can chip in. Otherwise you'll force me to read it. Right, okay, so Moss is um, chipped in, that's good. Um, things are really bad emotionally, um, maybe quite, um, oh, um, addictive behaviours, yep, that's good, emotional support, um, and bad emotionally, um, yeah, they might have been literally stabbed in the back. Okay, so we'll go with that as a general reading. We don't have to go into this in too much detail to demonstrate the actual method itself, because the method is very simple, and you already know how this is going to work because of the Kabbalah. So basically the person is stuck. Um, all of their ideas are now um, at the 10 stage, whoops, uh, the 10 stage um, here. Um, so they're now completely and utterly stuck um, incidentally, if you've got Secrets of the Waitsmith Tarot, you'll realise that this card is actually a scene from the play Beckett um, um, by Tennyson, 
um, and that's why um, he's got the red robe, the hair shirt and the white under robe and he's making the sign of the Hierophant or the Pope um, here. Um, and why you've got the storm clouds and why the swords are in his back, including in his head. That's actually a direct scene out of um, uh, the play Beckett, where he gets stabbed by the knights and the storm clouds come. And um, that's why Pamela's painted him um, as a um, um, hierophant or pope. Okay, and so that correspondence also tells me personally when I read this card that um, the person's ideas have come to an end. They've not got them anywhere. Um, they've absolutely, um, yeah, an end of problems. You could move forwards, but there's uh, mental problems, um, uh, a fixation of ideas. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce uh, Ziga, um, but um, I hope that's, that's close enough. Um, Lily is saying, feel bound at the moment, can't move out of the situation, so you've got the extra chains and binding on the devil card, of course, and um, so it's really stuck. The, uh, these two cards are really stuck. Bad times are coming to an end. You pursue what you love, as Evelyn is saying. That's great. So there's a sort of general negativity. That devil is sort of sat quite high above the other two cards, and then we've got some ending of ideas, um, something that was planned maybe has come to an end. People have um, stabbed you in the back. They've not supported you. And now it feels like you've got to maybe go it by yourself, follow your own holy grail and sort of move forwards as fast as you can um, with your own vision. But it's very... Um, stuck. Um, you could read that and then say, right, the person's got to go on with their own vision, but the person might leave not really knowing how to do that. And that is where this becomes in the next step method. With the next step method, we take a very simple thing from Kabbalah. What we basically say is that the next step from any card is the next card down and it's as simple as that in the same ward as uh, that card is in so the next step from a two is a three the next step from an ace is a two the next step from a three is a four the next step from a four is a five five to six six to seven seven to eight eight to nine nine to ten and um, um no prize for guessing what um uh, the next step from a 10 is given what I've um, um, clued you in on at least twice already. What is the next step from a 10? Is that the final step or is there another step? What is the next step from the 10? If we go from 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 and all the way to the bottom, what next step from a 10? And none of the class moves on until someone answers. Hey, right, brilliant. Good job. Yeah, we go back to the ace because Malkuth is in Keitha and Keitha is in Malkuth. We cycle around. Everyone's got it. Brilliant. Excellent. There we go. You see, you, you're getting Kabbalah now, so you're getting that Kabbalistic head to your tarot cards. They're not a straight line. They're a loop, a continual loop of creation. Brilliant. We start again. So the 10 is not the end. It never is. It goes, goes back to the ace because it's got nowhere else to go. So what we do then is the next step from the 10 of swords is, of course... The, here's one we prepared earlier, the Ace of Swords. So we go from the Ten of Swords, whoops, let me see if I can do this, at the bottom, to the Ace of Swords back at the top. If we take the same principle then, what is the next card on from the Devil? Now, if you think about the Devil card, um, the Devil is card 15, so this follows the paths on the tree of life and it follows it in numerical order the same way um, um, that the triumphs were 
uh, arranged with the original um, Tree of Life, um, sorry, the Tree of Life, um, got some conspiracy theory in there. Um, the triumphs were arranged um, just by order of their virtue, so following the devil came exactly the tower, card 16. So, hopefully you're way ahead of me already. The Knight of Cups then, what is the next step for the Knight of Cups? What is the next step for the Knight of Cups? What does the Knight of Cups in the four worlds that we talked about in a previous session become in the world of Bria, um, the world of creation? What does the Knight next become? I, I like the um, lag in the Facebook group because it gives me time to think that no one's going to answer and then I get a whole load of answers. Exactly. The Queen of Cups. The Knight becomes the Queen. And this works with the Thoth deck, it works with the Golden Dawn deck, and technically it works with any deck, but particularly these things because they're so close to um, uh, the original Kabbalistic schema on which the cards were designed. So, what we then end up with perfectly is this stuck situation where the person goes, OK, well, I can see how bad it is and I can see that I need to move on with my dreams and um, uh, so forth and sort of ride along. Um, but how? Uh, what do I do about it? You simply get the next card and suddenly you've got a totally different answer. A totally different answer. Look at that as the next step. That is their next step, Kabbalistically. The, um, the universe is literally, we've got a snapshot of them um, here. Let me try and do this. That's where they are now, over here, um, over here. Um, but the universe is now telling them to come here. That is their next natural step from that situation. And you can do this with any reading, any um, 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 spread, um, any deck. And just find the next card. If it's a particular card that they're stuck on, just find the next card for that one. If it's um, a particular set of three. And now you can lay these cards out and this answers the question, this is what you do next. This is what the universe is literally poised for you to do next. Incidentally, if you get a king, then of course, the next card is the page, because it goes round in the same suit, page, knight, queen, king, page. Um, if you get the world card, it goes to the magician. So 21 goes back to one in the major arcana. And guess which card? is um, the only card to not have a next step, which is the only card in the tarot that never has a next step because it's totally free already. There's only one card and it works numerologically and it works symbolically, it works cabalistically, it works spiritually, and um, it sort of holds the whole system together because there's only one card that doesn't have a next step and that's because it has the next step actually pictured on it quite literally. And what card is that? It's only one card that doesn't have a next card. Thinking about the world that goes back to the magician, 22 goes back to one because it's standard. Exactly. Um, um, nice, interesting um, uh, suggestion from Marcy about the Wheel of Fortune. Sort of, because it's a 10, but that actually goes to justice. That has to balance. Um, Derek's got the answer, and um, Anna's got the answer. It's the fool. The fool, the zero card, or more precisely, the unnumbered card, is totally free. It has all possibilities ahead of it, so it doesn't have a fixed next step. And the beauty is, is it's the main card that shows a next step on it. The fool is about to step over a cliff. Isn't that cool? So, um, just to answer Joanne, um, I would do a normal reading, like a three card reading, read for the situation, and then I would select out the three next cards, manually select them out, choose them based on their numbers, 
um, for the next step part of the method. So in effect it's a general reading, say three cards, five cards, four cards, or even a one card reading, and then I would choose, um, so that would be divinatory, I would just shuffle the deck, get the person to shuffle it, um, draw, draw a card, um, and it's an important distinction between drawing a card and selecting or choosing a card, and then I would then go and select for the second half of the reading um, the three cards or the two cards or the one card, four cards, um, that then follow it, um, follow those three cards in the sequence. Ah, now Rebecca's asking a trick question um, um, which is already catered for in the method. What would you do if the next step was already in the first reading? So say for example if this had, if your first reading like this one actually had the Ten of Swords and the Ace of Swords in it, in effect the next step is already in the existing situation. And that's the answer. The next step is already in that particular part of the situation. And the person knows it and usually does when that's happened, at least in my experience, where they say, yeah, I know, I really have to do something about that. I know that already. And basically the next step method just shows that they already know the next step. Um, and that's already incorporated within the reading method um, itself. So here we can see then that this stuck situation uh, with the Ten of Swords, the Devil and the Knight of Cups is then basically telling them you've got to make one decision. So your next step is to narrow it down to the one decision that you can make. You can make one clear cut decision and you can do it right now this second um, because it is literally the next step that you have to take. Um, you can get the client to do it before they leave the room, that's quite powerful. Um, it will be a game changer, it will destroy something, and it must be a decision that is quite destructive. And as a result, you have to know what it is that you really um, emotionally want on the other side of this destruction. And so it answers that the next step is one decision one decision that you have to make. And of course we can see here now the Keitha in the world of Atzileth, uh, sorry the world of Yetzirah um, is the sort of crown of thought, it's a singular thought. And um, it's quite interesting that we also have quite coincidentally a lot of these little Yod symbols here and here. So it's, it's going to break a lot of eggs to make this, um, make this omelette if you'll um, pardon the uh, metaphor. But um, that's what the person has to do. And they need to make that one decision in order to. But already you see, we've moved them away from their current situation. The problem when you do a reading is it fixes their situation to the cards that are on the table. Even if some of those cards are a future position. Whereas this two part reading means that they have in their mind, they have, those were my cards, but now I've got new cards and that makes a little leap for them that they can make a next step, that there's always a next step to make. Make sense? And so hopefully you can um, play around with that and in effect what you're doing is you're um, accepting that your reading is a snapshot cabalistically of the situation as it is, but you always know a bit like the I Ching that has moving lines that tell you that the situation is always in flow, it turns your tarot deck into a far more dynamic deck um, that's showing a process, not a fixed snapshot at any particular point. And it helps free your client up to be aware that, yes, this is the situation, but it's already moving towards another situation. And that opens up a next step and the possibility of a next step um, for them. Makes sense? And does it make sense um, um, cabalistically? Oh, I like take no prisoners, jump, love, we'll see you home. That's a really nice um, um, interpretation of those three cards. Very direct, very um, um, poetic as well. And um, I would actually ask them to tell me what their sword was before they left the room. What is the sword that you are going to hold um, as your next step um, to 
escape the situation that we talked about in the first half of the reading. Brilliant. Okay, so go and have fun with that, experiment with it, um, and so on. And uh, say so that's one of the many methods in Tarosophy that um, are sort of original to, to that particular um, approach to tarot. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to return to our fairy story, and in our fairy story we are now um, enacting a little rosy cross ritual in Tifreth, because Lola Daydream has had the fairy prince um, take her up to Tifreth, the Golden Palace, and um, we're now, we left them in a um, ritual um, that was enacted, and unfortunately, it appeared that the fairy prince had died. So if we're ready for a um, bed night, um, bedtime story, um, here we go. <clears throat> so, where had we got to? Um, Okay, um, I'm just trying to remember where we got to. Um, so the nail stopped hurting, there was a little crucifix. Um, um, oh, the great chest, that's where we were, wasn't it? Um, um, ah, there we go. And there was my fairy prince, quite, quite dead. That's where we got to. If you only knew how sorry I felt, but I had with me a walking stick with wings and a shining sun at the top that had been his. This is the wand of the adept in the Golden Dawn ritual. And I touched him on the breast to try and wake him, but it was no good. Only I seemed to hear his voice saying wonderful things, and it was quite certain that he wasn't really dead. So I put the walking stick on his breast and another little thing he had, which I had forgotten to tell you about. It was a kind of cross with an oval handle that, it, that he had been very fond of. But I couldn't go away without something of his, so I took a shepherd's staff and a little whip with blood on it and jewels oozing from the blood, if you know what I mean, that they had put in his hands when they had buried him. Then I went away and I cried and I cried and I cried. But before I got very far, they called me back, and the people who had been so stern were smiling, and I saw that they had taken the coffin out of the little room with seven sides, and the coffin was quite, quite empty. Then they began to tell us all about it, and I heard my fairy prince within the little room saying holy, exalted things, such as the stars trace in the sky as they travel in the car called millions of years. Then they took me into the little room, and there was my fairy prince standing in the middle. So I knelt down, and we all kissed his beautiful feet, and the myriads of eyes like diamonds that were hidden in his feet laughed joy at us. One couldn't lift one's head, for he was too glorious to behold, but he spoke wonderful words like dying nightingales that have sorrowed for the fading of the roses, and pressed themselves to death upon the thorns. And one's whole body became a single eye, so that one saw as if the unborn thought of light brooded over an eternal sea. Then was light as the lightning flaming out of the east, even unto the west, and it was fashioned as the swiftness of a sword. By and by one rose up, and then one seemed to be quite, quite dead, and buried in the centre of a pyramid of the most brilliant light it is possible to think of. And it was wake light too, and everyone knows that even wake darkness is really brighter than the dream light. So you must just guess what it was like. There was more than that too, I can't possibly tell you. I know too 
Y-N-R-I on the ring meant. And I can't tell you that either because the dream language has such a lot of important words missing. It's a very silly language, I think. By and by, I came to myself a little. And now I was really and truly married to the fairy prince. So I suppose we shall always be near each other now. There was the way out of the little room with millions of changing colours. Ever so beautiful. And it was lined with armed men waving their swords for joy like flashes of lightning. And all about us glittering serpents danced and sang for joy. There was a winged horse ready for us when we came out on the slopes of the mountain. You see, the sixth house is really a mountain called Mount Abiginus. Only one doesn't see it because one goes through indoors all the way. There's one house you have to go outdoors to get to because no passage has ever been made. But I'll tell you about that afterwards. It's the third house. So we got on the horse and went away for our honeymoon. I shan't tell you a single word about the honeymoon. And that's where we'll leave Lola and the Fairy Prince for now. Um, going on their honeymoon after the strange death and wedding um, that Crowley is alluding to there. So, um, if you would like some uh, further background reading for our fairy story, then I would also direct you to the uh, Alchemical Wedding of Christian Rosencruz. There's a great translation of it by Adam McLean. I think it's on the Alchemy site. And if it is, I will direct you to it with a link separate in the Facebook group. Um, the Chimical Wedding, you'll start to realize, is what Crowley is um, almost rewriting with his own Thelemic and Tarot slant to it. But um, the Chimical Wedding of Christian Rosencruz is where a lot of the uh, then contemporary Rosicrucian orders got their uh, central mythos from and um, it's part of the core writings um, in Germany that formed the whole Rosicrucian uh, mystery and um, um, there's, a, there's a whole rabbit hole down there that you can um, uh, follow but it's called the Chimical Wedding or the Alchemical Wedding of Christian Rosencruz and it's one of the original Rosicrucian pamphlets published in Germany. So um, I'd like to leave it there. I hope you found the next step method useful and the background to it. Um, oh, there's an audible book for it, the Alchemical Wedding. Um, there is a book, um, a fiction book called The Alchemical Wedding and I can't remember the name of the author, the word Robin is coming to mind, um, um, but it's a fictional book and it's also quite interesting, it's, it's an interesting read, it's um, not what I thought it would be but it's, um, it's a very interesting semi-alchemical uh, novel um, based loosely on the original um, chemical wedding. Okay, thanks a lot. I'll drop the links in the Facebook group and um, I look forward to seeing you all um, well, healthy and as um, safe, sane and protected as you can be under whatever situations are local to you at the moment. Okay, take care. Bye for now everyone.